Our second panel today will focus on Isamu Noguchi as an artist, connector of Japan and American cultures, and of course, the addition of floor frame to the White House collection. The discussion is moderated by my good friend, Dr. Joshua Walker, who serves as the president and CEO of the Japan Society. Thank you, Stuart. I'm particularly excited to be part of this celebration here at Japan Society. I'm excited about talking about Isamu Noguchi and what this sculpture floor frame means uh, for the People's House collection. So let me, without further ado, bring up our distinguished panelists. Let me start with Dakin Hart here in New York as a senior curator of the Noguchi Museum. Thank you, Dakin, for joining us today. Next, we have Yukie Kamiya, the gallery director right here at the Japan Society. Thank you, Yukie. And last but certainly not least, we have Akihito Nakanishi, who's joining us from the Portland Japanese Garden as a curator. Thank you, Aki-san, for joining us. Thanks. So let, let's jump right in. Dakin, let's start with you. Can you just, at the broadest level, tell us who was Noguchi, and then how does this sculpture, the floor frame, fit into the White House collection? But even broader, what can you tell us about Isamu Noguchi's life, uh, his influence as an unconventional sculpture in the U.S., and also the impact on the larger global art scene? That's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Noguchi really is one of the 20th century's most extraordinary Americans. Um, and I think he's becoming increasingly important because other artists and other creative professionals recognize him as a sort of avatar for what 20th cent 21st century creativity looks like. Um, I thought I would do kind of a quick tour through his life just because it, it was an absolutely extraordinary life that covered the entire 20th century. Um, Noguchi was born to a Japanese father, a well-known itinerant poet named Yonahira Noguchi, um, and an American mo mother, Brooklyn-born, Bryn Mawr educated, a brilliant woman, great writer and editor. Uh, that's how she met his father. He was born in a shack uh, in Orange County, California. So he was an LA boy. He wasn't named until he was three years old. His <clears throat> mother just called him Yo, or boy, because she was waiting for his father to name him. Uh, she followed his father back to Japan and took Noguchi with her. And Noguchi went to elementary school in Japan. And uh, I think we have a, a photo of him in kendo gear at about at the age of about six. Um, his mother sent him back to the United States to go to a learn by doing um, <clears throat> high school in Indiana, of all places. Noguchi, to the end of his life, would joke about it and talk about it and was very proud of being a Hoosier. Uh, he ended up going to high school in Laporte, Indiana, and really uh, was very Midwestern in many ways. Um, he left there to uh, go to New York. Um, he served as a kind of a, um, a nanny uh, and tutor uh, to Gutsan Borglum's children and was an assistant to Borglum. Borglum is the sculptor who made Mount Rushmore. And um, Noguchi had a terrible time with him. And uh, in the end, he told Noguchi that Noguchi would never be a sculptor and to forget about it, to give it up. Uh, Noguchi was also incredibly interested in medical science. He was inspired by his namesake, um, who's a famous, Hideo Noguchi was a famous virologist. Uh, and he, so he went to New York, he enrolled at Columbia as a pre-med student. And he did about a year there before his mother convinced him that he was destined for better things. And funny enough, by that, she meant being an artist, uh, not a doctor. So he went to New York and uh, after working with, with Borglum, um, ended up uh, uh, leaving Columbia and studying with a, an Italian immigrant named Onoro Rotolo um, at a little art school down in the village um, called the Leonardo da Vinci Art School. And um, after that, he once or one thing led to another. He was a prodigy. Um, he was immediately able, I think we have another image of Noguchi in front of an audience in Newark, carving a perfect scale model of Borglum's over life-size seated Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And he did that in clay uh, before a, a watching audience, a totally extraordinary thing at 18 years old. And that was only after a few months of, of uh, being a sculptor. So he's the only person, other uh, artist to come out of Brancusi studio, the Romanian sculptor, Constantine Brancusi, who is sort of the high priest of, of modernism. Uh, and Noguchi, uh, they really didn't even share a language when Noguchi started in his studio, but Noguchi spent about six months with him. And that really kicked off his, his sort of career as an international personality. 
Uh, before he was 30, he had proposed monuments to Benjamin Franklin. He was working with the WPA, like many artists at the time, monuments to, w, uh, to Benjamin Franklin, who was a hero of his uh, as an inventor. Um, by that time, he was already best friends with Buckminster Fuller, the great technologist um, and futurist. Um, he proposed a monument to the plow, which was a four-sided pyramid topped by a stainless steel abstraction of a plow blade. Um, which was the technology that, quote unquote, settled the West, um, which, which was of interest to him for that reason. Um, this idea of this pyramid was that it would be crop rotated. So it had four different faces and those would change with the seasons. Um, he also proposed a one square block play mountain for anywhere in New York City. Um, he had a terrible long term relationship with Robert Moses, uh, who liked things regular and Noguchi was never regular. Um, he also uh, designed the most famous coffee table of the 20th century, uh, arguably the most famous table, one that you see still popping up everywhere. It's been in more or less continuous production since it was designed in the mid 40s uh, for Herman Miller. Uh, he also his Okari lanterns, um, which uh, Yukie may say a little bit about in his, his cultural connections to Japan. Um, he would make a great uh, effort throughout his life to reconnect with Japan and to draw on Japanese craft traditions in particular um, in, in what he called the true development of old traditions. Um, and the most important of, of those is Akari. Um, some of you may have Akari lanterns. Uh, Akari really is, uh, I always say now, the, the most ubiquitous sculpture on earth if you accept a few religious icons. Um, more, somewhere around half a million um, have been made and sold, and they are humanizing every environment that they're in. Noguchi always joked that all you really needed to have a sense of home was a room, some kind of flooring, and a Kari lamp. Uh, in the 20th century, Noguchi is a kind of zealot like figure. Uh, he pops up everywhere in an extraordinary way. Um, I think one of the images we have to share here is a tea ceremony, a mid-century tea ceremony, that's a, whole, a lot of interest to a lot of people for, for uh, reasons that you'll, you'll see. So it's, it took place in the uh, Charles and Ray Ames's um, case study house in Pacific Palisades, California. And it was a tea ceremony uh, at which Noguchi and his movie star wife were um, the hosts. And uh, the guest of honor was Charlie Chaplin. And uh, it's kind of one of these amazing collision of worlds events um, with, with just a few photographs, um, not as many as, as we'd like to have. We don't know as much about this event as we'd like to have, but it's kind of typical of Noguchi. Um, around the same time, um, he was in India about a week when he was introduced to Jawaharlal no, uh, Nehru, uh, who asked him to make a, a memorial for Gandhi, uh, who had died just a couple of years before. He was in Indonesia right after Indonesian independence and where he famously got in a fight with Sukarno uh, because he, uh, he was asked to make a bust and he wanted to make a bust. Uh, Noguchi wanted to make one without the famous hat and um, Sukarno wasn't having any of that. Um, it's kind of typical Noguchi story. Um, he very famously, I think we have a photo, a very good photo of the uh, installation of the UNESCO Paris headquarters garden. Um, Noguchi made a, uh, an installation for the Delegates Plaza there, as well as a garden which he called a somewhat or a semi or a sort of Japanese garden. Uh, nothing in Noguchi is ever pure. Everything is always hybrid. Uh, he said in 1942, hybrid, to be hybrid anticipates the future, which I think of as his version of I have a dream or uh, words from the Declaration of Independence. It's kind of, uh, you could put it on American coinage and it, it wouldn't be out of place. To be hybrid anticipates the future. Um, he was very fortunate to represent the United States uh, in 1986 at the Venice Biennale. And uh, his exhibition was called What is Sculpture? Uh, he had spent his entire life trying to expand the boundaries of sculpture uh, in a kind of infinite way. He was very interested in the expanding universe. And uh, I think he thought of sculpture that way. Um, and we have a, a photo to share of Noguchi sliding down his own 10 foot tall, 80,000 pound white marble slide, uh, which was the centerpiece of his exhibition, uh, which was dominated by Akari actually, because everybody had told him that he couldn't include Akari in the exhibition 
because it was viewed at the time, the Venice Biennale was still thought to be, there's sort of this ideal of it, of its artistic purity, um, which meant no commercial activity, which of course was ridiculous even then. And it's, it sounds even sillier now uh, because it's a huge art fair. But um, Noguchi insisted on including Ikari because he knew how important it was. And then the last photos um, I wanted to, to share and to talk just a little bit, the, the big uh, unfinished project at the end of his life, which ended up being executed posthumously by his long-term friend and uh, architectural partner, um, Shoji Sadao. Uh, it was at Morinuma, it's called Morinuma Park. It's a land, redeveloped landfill right outside the city of Sapporo on Hokkaido. And it's a 454 acre development. Um, and there, I always joke that it's, it's Noguchi Disneyland because all of the land art that Noguchi proposed beginning in the early 30s and through most of his life, most of which was never executed, um, is executed there. And uh, it's an absolutely extraordinary place that includes two purpose-built mountains, uh, including Play Mountain, which is 100 feet tall um, and has multiple uh, irregular terraces. Um, and when you walk up the backside of it, it, it feels like ascending into heaven. And uh, Morinuma also uh, features an amazing thing, which I think of as a kind of a bookend to that shed that Noguchi was born in. Um, he made there something called Sea Fountain. And over the course of a 45 minute computerized program in a 300 foot diameter bowl, concrete bowl, it replays literally the biblical flood. Um, so it goes from sort of spouting fountains to filling that enormous bowl, turning it into the ocean with waves throughout that entire diameter. And then the entire thing uh, drains away and then fountains come back up. And if there's any sun at all uh, in the day, you get rainbows everywhere, uh, no matter where you stand around this amazing fountain. And that's a pretty good summary along with the garden which Noguchi thought of as the model for what sculpture should aspire to and what the role that sculpture should play in society. Um, that this, this idea of the sort of the, the new, new dawn. And, and if, if anything, uh, I would say Noguchi's principal importance, um, there, there are lots of component elements, but um, he really was after trying to rescale our perception or recalibrate our perception of where we fit into the order of things uh, and into reality. Um, because he felt that we had fallen out of scale with nature and with the universe. And uh, he was determined to uh, kind of re cement those connections uh, and to help us find our place. Thank you, Dick. And that was a tour de force. Uh, just looking at those images, it's just kind of amazing to think about the impact that, uh, you know, someone like you that understands the intricacies and even uh, people on the outside uh, to see the importance. So let me come back to you, but let me uh, move on to Yuki. After seeing uh, the importance of Noguchi, um, you know, how has Noguchi's legacy helped bridge the United States and Japan and maybe even Asia to expand the notion of sculpture uh, that, that Dakin just talked about? Um, please. Thank you for the question. So to start to answer this, I'd like to start introducing the forward by Mark-Minster Fuhrer, the one of the mentor of Noguchi. Fuhrer wrote to uh, Noguchi's autobiography that Isamu Noguchi and the airplane were both born in the U United States in the first decade of the 20th century. Noguchi took off from one, one country, one culture to other and travel all over the world by airplane, uh, the first generation of global artists. He landed in Japan in 1950 as his third visit and the first visit after the World War II. At the time, Noguchi received a grant and depart a long journey to Europe, India, China, and arrived in Japan. His stay at the time had a tremendous impact to him as an artist and become a major source of his future in, uh, in innovative project, including the floor frame, which is now in the White House collection. Please let me show you an image which I took in September when the New York Museum reopened. The ceramic sculpture, the title is Even the uh, Centipede. Uh, it is made by Noguchi 
and it, in the collection show at the Museum of Modern Art. Noguchi made this piece in Japan in 1952. So you can see how it was in Japan. In Japan, Noguchi was willing to visit an expected place for a cutting edge fine art artist. He went to Kill uh, in Seto and in Kasama and won for one with a handicraft uh, technique. And he also visited traditional paper lantern factory in Gifu in Japan which became his famous and lightest sculpture series, Akari, which they can just introduce you. So he's uh, Akari, and from a traditional craftsmanship in Japan, Noguchi broadened the vocabulary of material and notion of sculpture. For Noguchi, art and sculpture is not object, but closely related with our daily life. Yes, art is life itself. Another example in his attempt of landscape design, which also expanded the notion of sculpture. And as an image, Noguchi worked with various architects in the whole life. In Japan, he often worked with uh, Kenzo Tange, a claimed modernism architect who designed the Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima. Tange asked Noguchi to design bridges located at the south of the uh, Peace Memorial Park as an entrance. And you can see his unique shape of the bridge, re bridge rail, which is his sculpture, but related with people's everyday life. He named two bridges as Tsukuru and the Iku, which means birth and death. The action to cross the bridge become the metaphor of the life cycle of human being. One more project in Hiroshima was a monument, Memorial to the Dead which couldn't be realized, but you can see the fascinating structure. Underneath of his monument sculpture, there is a room underground. Noguchi sculpture, Noguchi sculpture or landscape project, I can say, visualize the space which is invisible. Like the floor frame suggests a space expanding underground same uh, we can see the start of the plan from his uh, monument in Hiroshima. And of course, people in Japan and Asia sit down on the floor. People and objects are on the same level. We can see the direct or indirect influence from the uh, Asian lifestyle to his art, which make his work be unconventionally unique. Thank you, Yukiya-san. Let me turn uh, to, to Aki-san uh, out in Portland. Uh, you've had the, the chance of, of serving as a diplomat over in Tokyo for the U.S. Embassy and, and kind of been on the front lines of public diplomacy. What is the significance of this Noguchi installation uh, here at the White House in the context of U.S.-Japan uh, relations, but more importantly, from a cultural diplomacy point of view historically and for today? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, first off, it is a huge honor for me to be part of this conversation. And uh, as a, like you said, cultural diplomacy expert, and uh, particularly within the framework of uh, US-Japan uh, bilateral relationship, um, I guess what I'm going to talk about is going to sound a bit like a history class, actually. But the <laughs> diplomatic relationship, actually, between the United States and Japan uh, goes back nearly 170 years when the famous, you know, the infamous delegation by the Commodore Perry negotiated a peace and amity treaty with the then Japanese government and opened Japan to the West and hence the rest of the world. Um, historically, though, the bilateral relationship uh, between the two countries were almost always motivated by security and trade for a very, very long time for obvious reasons. Even though high-level civilian efforts to foster discussion across the Pacific Rim existed before the Second World War, the bitter and contentious period during the war truly told the world leaders that we really needed more, much better understanding of each other's culture through people-to-people -people exchange and dialogue beyond analysis of trade opportunities or strategic alliance. So basically what that meant was that all we need, well, we actually need a third pillar to the diplomacy, the third pillar for international dialogue in addition to economy and security, and that was cultural diplomacy. 
And nowadays, it's more broadly defined as public diplomacy, Josh, like you, you mentioned earlier. Cultural diplomacy is about winning the hearts and minds of the people, uh, the foreign populations that a country is dealing with in a non-coercive manner. That's, that is to say it's a strategic policy that's really designed to get people to like you. So you stand a better chance of getting their attention for other important issues involving business and security. It sounds very much common sense and uh, just like any other human relationships, but here I have to say that Isamu Noguchi was the first and perfect example in the post-war US-Japan diplomatic relations where individual artistry paved the way for a deeper understanding of each other's culture, values, and philosophies, thereby making possible a myriad of other conversations and forums, both hard and soft, of course, to take place between our countries and beyond. So, in fact, um, you know, just a cursory look at the eclectic range of friends, comrades, contacts in his Rolex reveals that he was just so deeply involved in the fabric of socialites and literally across all borders and borders that almost all of the international arts and intellectual exchange frameworks that follow thereafter from the you know, establishment of the International House of Japan by the Rockefeller Foundation and a group of Japanese leaders back in 1952, the post-war arts and culture exchange programs by the US State Department in over 190 countries worldwide, to the NEA, that's the National Endowment for the Arts, their public art program called Art in Public Project that began in 1962, all had some sort or some form of influence from Isamu Noguchi or at least aspiration to replicate an aspect of his impact in shaping the high level discourse in all matters beyond art. So put simply, he was one of the um, cultural and philosophical giants of our era, to say the least, who fashioned a conscience for a greater race than either of his own, that is humanity. So, to say that he's, um, that is really to say that um, his artistic values and aesthetic appeal were really universal. And here cultural diplomacy experts and practitioners alike have things to learn, you know, one or two things to learn from him. His art history didn't just reach the highest strata of society on both sides of the Pacific, but he also captivated the masses as his timeless design products have literally won the hearts and minds of ordinary people who just wanted a piece of Isamu Noguchi in their own living rooms. So drawing on the traditional Japanese view of this um, non-linear relationship between art and craft, there is no boundary between art and craft in, in Japanese culture or Japanese craftsmanship or artistry. He truly embraced that and transcended art genre as well as space and time. So I think one of the biggest lessons lies here actually one that is more relevant relevant now than ever, given that we are all given what we are all going through at the moment, his landscape architecture, um, sculpture, design products, and his larger than life character always pointed to not what is peculiar about one culture or individual, but rather pointed to what is common to all peoples, regardless of race, faith, age, or gender, for that matter. And that is what makes and keeps Isamu Noguchi so timeless and relevant many years after his departure. So I'm just simply looking forward to learning more about Isamu Noguchi from other experts on the panel today and um, looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, you guys have each laid out so much there that it's clear uh, that for anybody who didn't know about Noguchi's life, that clearly here is an icon uh, that is not only uh, a celebrated American, a celebrated Asian American, but a global citizen in all of that facet. Dakin, let me start with you. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, the complexity uh, and larger than life, uh, both uh, work and also his personality in some ways. Um, Obviously, uh, Isamu Noguchi is, is, a, is a combination of kind of both his U.S. and Japanese lineage in a very difficult moment in our history during uh, a world war uh, that saw these two countries uh, go at each other. What does the inclusion or the addition of this particular uh, sculpture, the floor frame, uh, 
uh, sculpture kind of mean uh, for the, the Japanese American experience and, and what does its inclusion in one of the most famous uh, houses, institutions in the world mean uh, for Noguchi in terms of uh, the broader uh, kind of population to get to know Noguchi in a way that maybe those that have not been paying as close attention, uh, what does it mean to you? Wow. Well, you know, he, um, I, I think I mentioned his participation in the Venice Biennale representing the United States. And he, he had been asked a couple of times previously. And as he thought about whether to accept, he himself put it in the context of um, a bill that was working its way through Congress at the time that would finally come to represent reparations. Uh, to Japanese Americans, uh, J Americans of Japanese ancestry who had been interned, um, incarcerated uh, against her will in World War II. Um, Noguchi had voluntarily interned himself in post in Arizona in order to try to redesign the camps uh, to be more humane, better societies, um, societies at all, um, and, and particularly to make them more culturally sensitive uh, because there were a lot of problems with the camps uh, for the people who were interned. Um, that, that effort was totally unsuccessful in the end, but it really stuck with him. And in truth, from Pearl Harbor to the dropping of the two atomic bombs uh, on Japan by the United States, um, those were sort of the two incredibly wrenching events, uh, obviously for the entire world, but Noguchi took them very personally. And uh, somehow they managed to ding even his optimism um, he had been a technological utopian, um, and to see the pinnacle of human or sort of the apex of human intelligence turn towards destruction uh, instead of creation was uh, really destabilizing for him. So when it, 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 uh, it came, comes to thinking about how, sort of how it all fits in, um, you know, he, he came, as, as Aki-san said, to he really believed in representing humanity. Um, he saw himself as a citizen of Spaceship Earth. He liked the, the Buckminster Fuller term for our planet overall. You know, we're all in it together on this rock zinging around uh, in, in the void um, and wanted us all to feel that way and tried to do things to make us feel that way. That is really what floor fame is about. What's remarkable about it is just how modest it is. It's a quite a small thing. Um, you know, it's a couple of shapes that, that seem to go into whatever surface they're placed on. But what it re really represents is a kind of armature for the world. Um, it's a root system that's going down, penetrating the planet infinitely. And it's, it's really a system of vectors um, and also pointing up in, into the sky. So it, it's, it's a kind of a, an essentialization of a tree in many ways, uh, connecting the earth and the heavens um, and as I said, trying to help every individual person standing in front of it kind of rethink their relationship to the planet and to the universe. Uh, and, and that's really what his work is about overall. Thank you. Yukie san uh, given uh, the kind of the importance uh, to the U.S.-Japan relationship of having the very first Asian-American piece of art uh, in the White House, being a Japanese-American, and exactly what Dakin just laid out of these two horrific moments that really uh, tore at the fabric of humanity and between our two nations, what do you think this sculpture that one day uh, will have a prime minister of Japan, the next time they visit the White House, this is going to be the thing that he wants to see the most, obviously because it represents uh, that relationship in a tangible form and it has that aspirational aspect, particularly in a moment right now where we all are in this together, particularly fighting COVID-19. What do you think the Japanese reaction is and also the broader implications of this for U.S.-Japan relations, Yukiya-san? Yes, uh, Noguchi's uh, sculpture has so much layer I can see. Uh, of course, from the Japanese point of view, floor is like a tatami or the place to lie, live. So immediately people can see some of the relation with our lifestyle. However, it's also very square shape. It's of course the uh, reflection of the modernism. So her, his inspiration is always not only one, as a global citizen, he inspired one thing, which always uh, local people, especially in Japan, like a craftsmanship. It's not the kind of uh, have the good value, but he revisit and uh, takes a more importance and the, from another point of view and adapt and change in another level. And it's uh, it's such a great uh, 
opportunity to see it's one uh, sculpture bullying all the different elements as in a global age, which is now it's uh, almost kind of all the people need to share some, some respect to other culture. And in the approach of the uh, Noguchi, we can see this blending of the different subculture, not only Japanese, not only Asia, but all the global citizens, which he did uh, already a long time ago. So it's a really amazing discovery and also lesson for us. Thank you. Aki-san, you talked about the long 170 years of history that's been really up and down. You know, here in New York, we're celebrating 160 years uh, when the first samurai came and, and went up Broadway. Uh, and to think about that to now 160 years later to have the first uh, Asian American be a Japanese American piece of art there. As you were describing the culture diplomacy and kind of the importance of maybe soft power that you were describing of arts, uh, Japan seems to have a particular pull. It seems that the aesthetics or uh, it's a distinctive uh, pull. And you can see that in Noguchi's work, but you can also see the distinctly American side of him as well to be bold and, 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 and thinking about these things. How do you think about this uh, sculpture in, in, the, in the White House now and how it fits into that broader context of those 170 years that began with kind of Commodore Perry's uh, forcibly opening an isolated nation to where we are today in very deeply unsettled times uh, with uh, kind of this island of stability with Japan and then also uh, Noguchi sculpture being unveiled at the White House? Very interesting question, thank you. Um, 170 years, 160 years, you know, from the um, point of view of Isamu Nobu, which is such a great artist uh, who really transcended the time, was probably a blink of an eye because he was always trying to transcend the notion of time and space. So, you know, I guess um, uh, putting my hat as a um, uh, cultural diplomacy expert aside, and kind of wearing my landscape architecture uh, kind of expert hat back on, you know, as a, as a Japanese guardian organization, it wouldn't be an overstatement for me to say that um, our guiding principles um, now are partially led by someone like Isamu Nobuchi, who stood and still stands for, um, um, you know, the eternal eternal kind of values, which is to uh, truly represent and explore the trinity of human ingenuity. That is the relationship, the intricate relationship between art, architecture, and landscape. And that's really a universal thing. It's not a, a specific to Japan or China or any other Asiatic culture for that matter. It was something that um, it, it took someone like Isamu Noguchi to rediscover, had always been there in place, but the insular, insular site uh, usually um, impede new discovery within, uh, within itself. So it does sometimes take an outsider's point of view and lens. So to us, Isamu Noguchi still stands as the, one of the very few artists in modern history who sought to really touch the core of Japanese garden as a land art while going so far as to really contemporize it and succeed it. So for the longest time since the Sakuteiki, for example, you know, humanity's oldest surviving guidebook to landscape design, that was compiled some 1200 years ago. There has been very, very few attempts by gardeners to, or landscape designers for that matter, to update the art form. The, you know, dry rock garden, for example, you know, came out as a result of attempts by the samurai, like you mentioned earlier, samurai ruling class, and their affili affiliated religious groups to really steer away from the mainstream landscape design of that time to come up with something that speaks more directly to the teachings of Zen. But remember, that was 800 years ago. So, you know, this is just incredible to think that he was, within his lifetime, was able to revisit his um, father's homeland, discover the core essence of what Japanese, Japanese culture and tradition stood for, and with his incredible and acute sense of space and time, he came to view the Japanese garden as a sculpture of space, rather than being fixated on the kind of design technicality of what constitutes a Japanese garden. And that is the view, uh, I guess, still shared by very, very few artists of our time. And uh, which is the reason why Isamu Noguchi is timeless, I think, and it has the infinite capacity to really contain any art in itself acting also as a conduit between 
arts and environment and viewers. And I'm pretty certain that will be the case for the new installation up at the uh, White House, reflecting the Japanese gift of perfecting the tradition, as well as um, uh, American ingenuity of embracing the tradition while always questioning it. Great, thank you. Dakin, you talked about uh, Isamu Noguchi as kind of like an avatar uh, of our time. We just heard uh, Aki-san say that he was timeless and we've heard about his contributions in Japan from Yukio-san. How do you think about uh, Noguchi uh, today? And obviously you're at a museum that is over 30 years old that has uh, really uh, been put to uh, talk about his legacy and to think about his influence for humanity, not just for New York, America, or Japan. How do you think about uh, Noguchi as an avatar for, for the world and, and we're living in right now with all of its complexity? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, he's really a model of the kind of America that we all believe in, um, you know, pluralistic and open minded and open uh, hearted um, and wanting to connect, you know, that idea of, of being a bridge. He saw himself as a bridge. Um, I always think of him as a kind of permanent voluntary exile from the dominant culture. Um, this is somebody who was interested in connecting, um, as Aki said before, he's a, he really was a cultural ambassador. Um, and he performed that role remarkably well. Um, I do want to just mention uh, a, a name in this particular context, in the context of the gardens, because Noguchi never did this on his own, and he didn't pretend that he did this on his own. Um, he was incredibly extraordinary in his, in his choice of friends or in his good fortune in his collaborators. Uh, and I just want to mention Mire Shigamori, mm -hmm. uh, was a, it was an extraordinary rebel uh, in the history of Japanese garden making and really is the person who modernized the Japanese garden in the 20th century. Um, you know, again, like Noguchi, volcanically productive. Um, and I would encourage anybody going to Japan or interested in Japanese gardens to make a special tour just of Shigamori's public gardens because they are absolutely extraordinary. And um, Noguchi and Shigamori didn't get along at all. Uh, they did collaborate. Noguchi never got along with his collaborators. He was quite an impossible <laughs> person. He was a bit of a, one of his better friends called him or called him the cactus. And I think that's a pretty accurate uh, summary of his, his personality. And of course he wanted to be the one breaking the rules and Shigamori wanted to be the one breaking the rules and wanted to be able to define how other people could break the rules. So they, there was tension there, but uh, there's no doubt that Shigamori was a model to him. And Noguchi was always very uh, straightforward about the fact that he was part of a lineage. Um, I think a Aki spoke very eloquently about uh, Noguchi. I always think of Noguchi as whip stitching the past into the future uh, because he, that's part of what I think he got from Japan was the sense of a much longer time horizon um, and working, I would say he, he really thought in geologic time, uh, not historical time, uh, which is a good way for human beings to think, to remember that we are, we're not even a blink in the history of our planet. Um, and that's, that's pretty helpful when you're thinking about the sort of day-to-day -day problems uh, that mostly self-created. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about why is Noguchi a model, it's because he is somebody, he didn't recognize boundaries um, he despised labels and stereotypes. Uh, he worked across media. Um, he refused to be categorized. Uh, and he was an artist on a mission. He was absolutely determined to help save mankind from ourselves. And um, that, you know, when you look at the sort of the model of the 21st century global citizen artist, um, Noguchi ticks almost all the boxes. And the, the interesting thing is that artists have always seen that. He's always been a model, a role model for other artists, particularly those on the margins, because he represented the margins his entire life. Um, he always said that he wasn't at home anywhere, so he made his, himself at home everywhere. And he practiced that in his work. Um, so it is, it is extraordinary the way that that is summed up in floor frame. And it's a very incongruous position now under the most beautiful magnolia tree uh, in the garden, directly opposite what is often called the most uh, powerful office in the world. Um, and when I think about, uh, and of course, we're so proud of its installation there. And for us, this is this is about the future and all time. It's going to be there for a long time uh, through administrations of every kind. Um, 
and hopefully offering a little bit of perspective. And that's really what the Noguchi Museum is. He founded the museum, which is still the only museum in America founded by an artist to show his, his or her own work. Um, he meant it to be an encapsulation of his point of view and his per perspective. And um, to, to have a little bit of that uh, there in the, the grounds of the White House, um, this kind of humbling um, uh, rescaling of the meaning of human existence for the person in that office making the kinds of decisions that that person makes, um, I think is, is an extraordinarily powerful statement, particularly given that it is biracial and multicultural and um, again, sort of um, open in its, its very fabric. Thank you. Uh, Yukiya-san, you talked about uh, kind of Noguchi's both literal and figurative bridge building between the US and Japan and kind of these formative trips he took back to his father's homeland. And we've heard a lot about uh, the impact this has had. But when you think about kind of the bridge building that he represents for US and Japan relations towards the future and the timelessness about this sculpture, but almost all of Noguchi's work, um, how do you think about the impact this not only will have at the White House, as Dakin just so eloquently laid out, but more broadly for future generations getting to explore and learn as the U.S.-Japan relationship changes over time, but the artwork and the sculptures that Noguchi, uh, you know, kind of was a part of uh, continue uh, to be physical reminders of this extraordinary life that uh, maybe he was a cactus, but it was in in, in the most extraordinary ways to break all the rules, which is very un-Japanese in some ways. Ways, but at the same time allows the U.S.-Japan relationship to continue to grow in innovations for the future. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part. And it's, Isamu Noguchi always say during in Japan, what the best thing is he found the lifelong friends. So since being in Japan at, in the 1950s, he met a variety of people, architects and artists and uh many people and then he has been continued to work of course he's a character so it's very he has the ego as artist but he has difficulty but he always need people to communicate to learn to expand inspire and expand the knowledge and his relationship is japan it starts from the communication with people so always this discussion with people arguing and to the considering and the devaluing it starts from the conversation so of course, as a visual artist, it's end up as sculpture or landscape art. However, always the point person is a human being. And then he really respect and many people and then exchange idea. Even the contemporary artists like Hiroshi Sugimoto, when he was young, he opened the uh, antique shop in Soho. Isamu Noguchi is the first customer and he purchased everything and become upgrading his, uh, his kind of store. It's a story always people appreciate uh, his uh, friendship and also sincere help. And it's always even the artist, it's starting point is a people's friendship. And this is a weekend long, it's now and a future from the past of the Isamu Noguchi. Thank you. Uh, Aki, with the last question, let me ask you about that friendship and that bond between people. Uh, the U.S. and Japan has gone through so much, uh, including uh, Pearl Harbor and the first atomic new bombs being dropped, and yet you can't find two nations that are closer today. Uh, what do you think the lasting legacy of Noguchi will be, regardless of politics, regardless of the, the current moment we live in for the future? Whoever lives in that White House and gets to see floor frame every time they walk out to the Rose Garden. And also in Japan, no matter who the prime minister is, how can Noguchi continue to be that powerful reminder going back to that idea of, of a cultural diplomat kind of as an ultimate symbol that we've all been talking about today? Another really <laughs> interesting question that we can talk about, uh, you know, for hours on end, but uh, I guess in a uh, in a few words, I guess I could summarize it, um, you know, as being able to embrace the tradition and past, but not being harnessed by it, is is uh, is what is something which really taught us uh, to a lot of Japanese artists and um, uh, scholars, and you know, po even policy makers alike, actually, and. Um, you know, the, the true value of his work uh, for not just cultural diplomacy experts, but 
for you know arts and culture experts across the board is the way he really tried to offer the experience of peace really it was part of his personal journey of self discovery probably to just to begin with but then he began realizing how relevant it is to other people all across all race um faith and uh you know ethnic uh backgrounds so offering that sort of experience of peace uh through nature and culture uh and uh, and also to pay long lasting respect to everyone who came before him just like you know Shigemori Mirai that uh, um they can talked about earlier uh all the all of the trailblazers that he paid respect to while at the same time really trying to establish his his own voice and artistic kind of identity as well so something that we can definitely learn from him uh especially uh the way he did it in the aftermath of the biggest calamity in human history and of course isan noguchi definitely was one of the one of the biggest figures who traversed in between different cultures philosophies that we talked about and artistic genres in order to not just find his own true voice but also to cross pollinate new ideas and innovations in the two countries that he devoted his his life trying to learn about so that's what really fascinates me about uh you know learning about his lifelong achievement and attainment um the way he really bonded uh not just two countries but the entire global uh cultures together uh that's how um i think makes this particular piece so fitting uh to the current times we're going through as well well, I want to thank each of you, uh, Dakin Hart from the Noguchi Museum, Yuki Kamiya from here at Japan Society, Aki Nakashima, Nakanishi, sorry, uh, here in uh, in the Portland Japanese Garden. Each of you have contributed, and I feel like I'm I'm leaving with just so much more excitement to not only see this particular piece of art that is in some ways going to have a much larger impact in terms of the education and the symbolism that it occupies as the very first Asian American piece of artwork in the White House, but also its location in the Rose Garden, uh, but also to learn more about uh, Noguchi and the impact that he's going to have uh, through his work that is timeless. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, the viewers, for joining us today. Uh, and I hope that we'll all get a chance to continue this conversation moving forward. Thank you and good day. Thank you to all of our panelists today. This has been an extraordinary experience, and I hope you have all enjoyed it as much as I have. You can learn more about all of the objects that were discussed today on our website, whitehousehistory.org. And remember, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, as is the Japan Society, and we depend on the support of private individuals like you and would be very appreciative of your support during this challenging time. You can make a donation to the association at whitehousehistory.org slash support. Thank you for tuning in today and have a great rest of your day.